Thank you. Thanks all for coming. It's the uh, start of a of sure an exciting week. So there's, there's, um, there's not going to be very much scheme in this, I'm afraid. Uh, so if you've come for the scheme, you probably knew there wasn't going to be very much scheme in this. The scheme that you do see in this is probably going to horrify you. So, um, so uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to tell a hopefully different audience about why I think types are really cool and some of the fun things you can do with them. So um, for uh, the last little while, probably a couple of years now, I've been um, tinkering with a new version of Idris. So I don't know if, uh, I, mean, I know some of you, because I recognize some of you, have played with Idris before, but just as a show of hands, has anyone seen it? Who's seen Idris before? Oh, that's actually most of you. Okay. <laughs> I, I might even be all of you. Uh, that's, that's never happened before. <laughs> So, that's the uh, right, <laughs> mm, yeah, so, okay, so in that case, I don't have to tell you what Idris is, I'll tell you about the new, why I'm doing a new version of Idris, um, essentially I Idris 1 had got to this point where it was, um, it was too hard to work on it, it, it had, um, software seems to evolve to a point where it's just unmanageable, and if you're in the luxurious position of being an academic, um, sometimes you can just chuck it away and start again and take what you've learned and, and build something um, with a whole new set of mistakes. <laughs> so, um, so Idris 2 is written in Idris 1 with a whole new set of mistakes and uh, being implemented, implemented in Idris 1 means that I get the opportunity to actually use this thing uh, and see how well it works for something that, uh, that is a bit larger scale. Uh, the answer turned out to be not very well. Um, so scaling it up to bigger programs really showed a few <laughs> rough edges in the system, which in turn has informed some of the things that should have happened in it should happen in Idris 2. One of which is generating code which runs fast enough and is generated fast enough. So this is where Scheme is going to come in in a bit. Um, so the reason I picked Scheme, by the way, so it, Idris 1 has this... Um, uh, just call it a plug-in system for uh, back-ends. So you can um, generate code for a variety of different target languages. So by default, you generate, um, you generate C. Um, so there's a JavaScript back-end. People have, have written all sorts of um, uh, back-ends for... What, what have we got? Oh, there's a PHP one that I did just as a bet. Um, um, but uh, one, one that really showed some promise was um, a scheme, a Shea scheme backend written by Nicholas Larson. So Nicholas Larson has made all sorts of fantastic contributions to Idris. In particular, uh, you have uh, Nicholas to thank if you're running it on Windows, because I would have no idea how to get it running on Windows otherwise. But he, uh, he uh, knocked up this Shea scheme backend, and it, and it basically outperformed the one that I'd slaved over uh, in C. And I, that was the point where I realized I was never going to write a runtime system again. I was going to find one that some professionals had done over decades, and probably that was going to work out better. So I thought I'd try writing a, uh, a scheme backend uh, for Idris 2. And, and I don't know if I should say annoyingly or excitingly, it worked in an afternoon and ran faster than Idris 1, basically in an afternoon. And that's just, that's just not fair. Why, did, why didn't I think of this earlier? Why didn't someone suggest this earlier? So um, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the new implementation of Idris. So I've said why I'm doing that. I'm going to show you some of the new things that are in it. So even if you have seen Idris before, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do the introduction again. But occasionally, there's going to be points where I show you something that's not quite the same as it was. I'm going to explain why that is, why it's better, and then eventually we'll see how that turns into scheme. OK, so <coughs> type-driven development. That's the thing I like to bang on about. Um, kind of by analogy with test-driven development, it's types come first. Um, we, um, we refine the program by essentially looking at the type. The types guide us towards the correct implementation. If we can't get quite the correct implementation, we go back to the types and refine them a little bit, and we do this cycle of um, type, define, refine is what I, I was told I had to have a three-word phrase for it. So, you know, red, green, refactor is test-driven development. Mm -hmm. Type, define, refine, that's type-driven development. So the hypothesis we're working under here, there's a very difficult hypothesis to test quantitatively, but it's that uh, precise types enhance program and productivity. If you have the right tools, the type system is there to help you. The machine is there not as your you know, enemy or your adversary. You type in the program and it says no. That's basically what happens in programming. Um, uh, you type in the program and the machine says, oh, what if you tried this? So you type in, you type in a bit of the program and then the machine types in the, uh, gives you the rest of the program. So programming should be like 
a conversation with the machine, not a fight with, uh, with, with, uh, with your adversary. Uh, also, um, most of the time, programs are incomplete. That is, uh, you've got a subroutine you haven't written, you've got a bit of the code that you need to fill in, and maybe you'll put in a placeholder, uh, you'll put in something undefined. Um, but really, the type system or the, the, the compiler should accept the programs exist in an incomplete state, and if they're incomplete, they should be able to give you a bit of help in order to complete it. And crucially, type checkers know a lot about your program. They've, they've analyzed it very deeply, and they're keeping a lot of information to themselves. So that information should be made available to the programmer. Um, we don't exactly know the right way to make that information available to the programmer. Like if you've ever programmed in C++, for example, anyone program in C++? Um, and uh, you enjoy the error messages? <laughs> so <laughs> David does. But, uh, um, the thing is, C++ compilers, they tell you everything about your program, like literally everything. You get, you get pages and pages of error messages. Um, <laughs> um, you don't necessarily want all that information. So we need to have some kind of way of, of figuring out how to ask the machine the right question. So, so we'll see how that's going uh, with Idris so far. Right, so I'm just going to move on to the, uh, the live hacking part of the talk. Um, am I actually... Uh, ooh, no, wait, wait. Um, I've, I've recently got a new computer and all the keys are in the wrong place. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, I think, given that you've all seen Idris before, I'm, I'm going to skip the very, very introductory bit uh, and, and move on to... Given that you've all seen dependent types before, you've all seen vectors before. Um, and, and, and I can tell that you've all died inside. It's, oh my god, he's going to do this. I am going to do this. And there's a reason I'm going to do this, uh, even though you've seen it before. Um, the reason I'm going to do this is to show you something very slightly different about what's going on inside Idris 2 that turns out to be really valuable. And that's about uh, quantities. So Idris is based on um, quantitative type theory. Very glad Bob is here, because nod to Bob. Thank you, Bob. Quantitative type theory is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, quantitative type theory, uh, with, it, with uh, QTT, everything, every binder has uh, a quantity associated with it. Um, there are three interesting numbers, 0, 1, and don't care. So, so we can count as high as don't care in this system. Uh, so is, uh, a binder with a zero quantity is something that gets erased at runtime. A binder with uh, one as a quantity, that is something that we promise to use exactly once at runtime, and everything else, the don't care, that's basically where we were with Idris at one. Now the difficulty with Idris one is that if, um, you know, when, when, you have, um, when you have values appearing in types, types appearing in values, and vice versa, it's not immediately obvious what is going to exist at runtime and what isn't. So it's kind of hard to think about that. I see a few people nodding. I think a few people have maybe run into some trouble with this before. Uh, I wrote a PhD about dealing with this. Uh, then I had a PhD student tell me I was wrong, and he did a PhD about a different way of doing this. <laughs> and then Connor and Bob came along and tell, told us we were both wrong, and there's a much easier way of dealing with this. So, it, so the, the easier way of dealing with it being that the, the type system tracks what is erased at runtime. So how does that, how does that lock in the system? So, um, so we've got the type here for a, an append function. So uh, we've got a vector with n things, a vector with m things, and append gives us back a vector with... Uh, I'll put n plus n. That's, that's the next step. <laughs> that happened because I practiced this <laughs> talk, and I didn't... Re sorry, I, it does happen sometimes. <laughs> and I didn't reset it after I did the practice run. Right, so, um, so the system is uh, add a candidate definition. Um, uh, we've got a hole on, on the right-hand side here, so the hole, the hole will tell us what we need to do to complete this program, and, oops, and uh, is this okay for size? Can you, can you see that? Uh, it's not, not too low. So you'll see what we have, th th this, this will perhaps be familiar, that we've got um, an M and A and an N, so we've got a NAT, we've got a type, we've got another NAT, and we've got our two vectors. The thing that may not be familiar is these mysterious zeros next to M, A, and N. So uh, in the type here, we've got, essentially we're saying for all N, for all A, for all M, this is the type of our function. So the fact that these Ns, this N, A, and M, are uh, written as these unbound implicit arguments is, is a hint to the system that we're not interested in these at runtime. We want to be able to talk about these things, but we don't want them when we run the program. And so the binders get a quantity of zero to reflect that. 
So that means, for example, if I try to pattern match on M, I'll get a type error. If I try to pass it to a function that doesn't have a zero uh, quantity for M, I will get a type error. Uh, other than that, we just carry on as before. So I can do um, you know, a case split on X's, and that gives me the two cases. And just as before, we can search for a, 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 a candidate implementation. It will give us something that matches. And in the other case, we can search for an implementation. The types tell the system enough that it can fill in that definition. Now, often at this point, people say, that's all very well, but you seem to be following a procedure there. Essentially, what you're doing is you're brute forcing the case split then search, you know, add a definition case split search. And why is that something you have to do by hand? Like, can you somehow abstract over yourself? Can you abstract over the process of programming and implement something that is essentially split and search? And it turns out the answer is uh, yes. So that's kind of fun. Um, so this is a new thing I've added in Idris 2, which is it, basically it's an, it's an internal thing, sort of hard coded. In, instead of the so control alt C for case split, control alt S for search, um, I hit control alt G, G for generate, um, go, go, go. I don't know what it stands for. Um, it, it I, I thought generate definition. Um, and what that does is it hits it with a hammer until it finds an answer. And so for zip with, uh, hit it with a hammer, finds the right answer. So that's, that's kind of fun. When I, I mean, I, I, I sort of thought, well, oh, I'll try it. What could possibly go wrong? And, and it, amusingly, it worked pretty much straight away because the type system, I mean, if you've got a type system that, uh, that, that guides you to the right program, it doesn't really take long to get these working. And I think I spent the next probably two days just writing type signatures, seeing, <laughs> seeing, where, uh, seeing what would, I've, I've, got, I've got some examples here, which I forgot to open, um, search is called. Uh, well, I forgot to undo it as well. Let's undo it. <laughs> so, um, so we've seen the Jin, the, the, the Haskell tool, the Jin, D-J-I-N-N. Um, so this is uh, an implementation of um, uh, Roy Dickov's algorithm for uh, proof search. So I thought I'd try a few examples from that. And um, I mean, when, when, when I give these talks, um, people say, well, you know, that, that's all very well, but you picked those examples specifically because you knew they worked, didn't you? And I have to say, no, guilty, yes, of course, <laughs> of course I did. Um, but it's kind of fun how often it does work. And, and the places where it works, so, you know, on curry, it's... Um, so this is a... Knowing, knowing about first and second is a new thing. So this, this turns out to be really useful for type class resolution, because when you write down um, uh, interface um, constraints, you tend to be writing them as pairs. So if I do that, if I, if I, if I teach search about um, first and second, it means exactly the same machinery that's used for this generating definition can be used for type class resolution. It's kind of fun when things just work out like that. So, so again, this is something else that's happened quite often in Idris 2, is just consolidating all the things that were, uh, I wonder if this will work hacks in Idris 1, and it turns out they're all the same. Um, so, uh, yeah, curry. So select things is just a thing that does some arbitrary stuff to a, uh, a few pairs. This is, this is an example from the Jin documentation. So, oops. So for some reason, oh, no type deck. Oh, thank you. That's because um, that's because the editor and the compiler are not quite on the same page, and I haven't worked out how to fix that yet. So if you don't hit save, it, call, it, it generates the definition for the for the wrong function on the wrong line. So um, if anyone knows how to fix that, please. Patch is yes. welcome. Uh, yeah, pro probably would solve it actually. Um, I don't. I don't uh, actually use Atom most of the time. Um, I, I usually use Vim, but I haven't implemented this machinery in Vim yet. So the the sort of place where it comes up in practice actually. So again, th I mean, this this is something you really do do when you're writing dependently typed programs. Is you have um, maybe you have a list and you have some other list and you want to show that there is. Um, uh, you, want to you want to explicitly say that there's a relationship between those two lists. So here I'm, I, I'm saying that, uh, oh, I'm, I'm saying that the, this is a relationship between a list and a number. So the, the element at a particular place um, in a heterogeneous list has a particular type. Uh, and if I go to the trouble of writing that type declaration to, to say, to explain what it means for a thing to be at a particular position, then I shouldn't also have to write the program because I've already done the work. And that's the sort of place where this search is really helpful. So if I've done it once, 
Um, I've already explained it to the machine. I didn't explain it to the machine in that particular way, but there is another way to do it. So, so that's the kind of situation where uh, this, this, this search will hopefully be a lot more useful than it has been in Idris 1, in particular because it happens a lot faster. Right, so that's uh, the basic mechanics of the system. But the really interesting bits are when we get to looking at quantities that are not just zero or we don't care. So um, the intuition behind this, so I don't, I don't see the linear Haskell work or, or um, so there's, there's some, I think it was a popple last year or maybe it was ICFP last year. But anyway, it's an extension to, uh, to Haskell uh, for supporting uh, linearity, um, where essentially um, an argument to a function is something that you have to use exactly once. So the intuition behind this uh, in Idris 2 is the same as the intuition um, that they have in Haskell, which is that uh, that might be a bit light to be readable, but it's, say if, if, um, if it is, I'll, I'll write it. I'll write it here. Um, so if we have um, a function that takes one x of type a and returns b, then if you have, uh, if, if something, if, if an expression f of x is used exactly once, then it means that x is used exactly once. So we could, for example, be in a context where f of x is used many times. That's completely legitimate. So then we don't have that guarantee. But if we're in a context where f of x is used once, it means that x is only going to be used once. So it's kind of, um, uh, it's kind of linearity in the sense of it's a promise not to share this variable in the future. So if I know that at this point I only have one of it, then in the future I'll only have one of it. So that means we can start doing things like um, uh, constant act time access for arrays while still being pure. It means we can do things like uh, resource tracking in the type system. So that's a thing that interests me. Uh, it doesn't yet mean we can, do, we can do away with garbage collection because it's only a promise that it won't be shared in the future. It's not a promise that it was never shared in the past. So maybe there's a bit more work we need to do to get that kind of performance benefit out of it. But we're basically at this point thinking, right, what can we do with this? What, what interesting problems can we solve with this? So just to show how that fits in with, um, uh, with the type-driven development, we've got this function. Well, if I, if I, if I have a function pair that, that takes uh, an x of type a and returns a pair of a's, then that's just going to be the, the only reasonable definition for that is going to be send back x twice. So, so that's what it finds for us. Now, if I instead, if I, if I say that this x has to be used exactly once, well, what happens? We'll go through it step by step. So I'll add a candidate definition. We look at pair RHS. What do we see? We see that we have an A, which is a type, and we're not allowed to use it. We can talk about it. We're not allowed to use it. And we have an x of type A, of which there is exactly one. So I could try writing, oops. Um, uh, the page down button is in the wrong place on this machine, and I still haven't got the hang of it. I'm sure the creators don't think that. But um, So if I check the type of pair RHS now, we've already used X. So let's hit Control-Alt-T. We've already used this X. So we see now that we can't use X again. So if I try to, um, it will say something very small. I don't know how to, I don't know how to make this bigger. And it's a tiny font, so I can barely see it even here. So it says there are two uses of linear name X. And, and it's not wrong. So, um, so I can tell some of you are thinking it. Sometimes people say, well, what happens if I put the x in the second position? Does the order matter? Um, and it, it doesn't matter because x is used somewhere else, so we can't use x here. Another interesting question is, um, what, happens if I don't, what happens if I don't give x at all? How many, how many x's will be? So I can use it either here or here. So if I look at foo, it says... Yes, you can use x here, but that means you're not allowed to look at it in bar. So that means that the type of bar now is 0a, 0x. So let's have a look at the type of bar. Uh, it actually says 1, because I'm not looking at foo at the minute. <laughs> so it's basically whichever one I'm looking at. If I haven't used it, I'm allowed to use it. So um, I have no idea how long it took to implement that. It's just one of those things that it's, like, it's obvious that this is the way it should behave. But it's surprisingly tricky to explain to the machine because, of course, it's just type checking a whole program. It has to go back and fill in the, uh, the details as, uh, when it gets to the end of elaboration. Okay, so let's let's get. We, we're never going to be able to implement this. This is uh, so. We'll, we'll comment that out. 
can it can it just to tell that it can't and uh no it's not that clever um uh is that is that even feasible it's kind of fun if it was but um yeah i don't i don't know how you'd do that so um Another fun thing about having um, these linearity annotations is, uh, is that it actually helps with um, the type-driven development and the generation, because it's just one more bit of information that the machine has. So, so one of the examples I sometimes give when generating programs is, is um, a map on vectors. So if you've got a vector that you're mapping a function over, the output has to be the same length as the input, which basically means everything in the vector has to be used exactly once. But there's another way of saying now that everything in this vector has to be used exactly once, well, or everything in the list has to be used exactly once. And that's to say that this list, x's, has to be used exactly once. So if I search for that, and I've had to be a little bit clever about the way I've annotated the other functions. Um, but if I say that this list has to be used exactly once, then the program search says, well, I'd better, I'd better do something to that list, which means that I have to apply this function, which means that essentially I end up with map. So, um, so I didn't intend for that when implementing QTT, and I don't, know if, I don't know if Bob intended for that sort of thing when thinking about QTT, but it's kind of nice that it works out. Anyway, there's a question. Uh, if I now want to call this LMAP with a function that uses its argument twice, Ah, oh, fantastic. Um, yes, yes. So that, that's a great question. You can't do that at the minute, and I would love to find a solution to that. And um, I'm glad someone spotted that, because, yeah, I just I tried to slip that by you. That I've said that f, um, I've had to, I, I'm saying here that f, f takes uh, an x that is consumed exactly once. So it has to, it has to, um, I mean, it, it could do anything before it returns the b with that, with that, uh, with that value. Um, so yes, it has to be something that, that, that takes the value exactly once. I'd kind of like some kind of, I think a solution to this might be to have um, uh, polymorphic, polymorphism in the quantities. And uh, I had no pressure, Bob. <laughs> if, you could figure, if you could figure that one out, I'd be very happy. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's, there's clearly much to be done on uh, how to use this in practice. So. So yeah, that's a good spot. So now sometimes, uh, another thing I talk about with, uh, uh, when, when presenting uh, Idris to a group who hasn't seen it before is that types are first class. That is, uh, you know, in some way that in, in functional programming, functions are first class, meaning that you can pass them to functions, return them from functions, compute them, and so on. So types are first class. You can pass types to functions, return them, and so on. And, and people say, well, you're not completely first class, are they? Because you can't pattern match on them. And that always bugged me. So with QTT, we can now reasonably say that you can pattern match on a type, and we don't lose any of the guarantees that, uh, that say, param the parametricity gives you. So we can, we can still be parametric in things, but actually we can be parametric in things that aren't types. It's kind of it's nice that... I mean, so the, um, I mean, parametricity is just sort of coincidentally about uh, types are irre irrelevant to programs. It's really about some arguments, the parameters, are irrelevant to programs. So yes, we can pattern match on types now. And I've got a little example here. It doesn't, <laughs> I haven't found an actual use for pattern matching on types now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's going to be one, but um, so I've had to do something contrived. Uh, so, you know, if, if it's an int, we turn the, we turn the string an integer. If it's a nat, we turn a string a nat. Um, I've, I've left a hole here for this matching on this function because it's kind of interesting to see what the types of A and B are. So I'll just give you a second to think what you might imagine the types of A and B to be. So, I mean, A is a type, because functions take types as input. Is B going to be a type? There's a little bit more to say here. Over right? right, so B, uh, B could depend on A, and B could be a different thing if A has a different value. So, in fact, the type of this is A is a type, and B is a function from A to type. Um, so if we want to be fully general in, the, in pattern matching on types, that's what we have to do. Uh, it's the right pain, actually, for doing... So I, it means I can't... Like, doing this sort of thing doesn't actually work, because I mean, maybe, maybe it should work, and it's probably a bug, but like, figuring out how to pattern match on that has, has proved challenging. Yeah, question? What about adding a non-dependent error? <sighs> yeah, so... Um, I've considered this sort of thing, because that would be useful for in quite a few other contexts. And it used to be, so when I was first working on Idris 1, I found it both fun and useful to add pretty much everything and see what happened. <coughs> and I learned a lot that way. And one thing I learned was not to do that. 
Um, or at least if, if you're going to do that, be super extra careful. Uh, hide it behind a language extension. So what I'm trying to do now is take things away rather than add things. So, but it might, even so, it might be something that's useful to have here. But um, anyway, just to show you that that's a thing that we're allowed to do. And all of these things, I mean, I'm, I'm partly showing you these things because we're going to end up at Scheme. And we need to figure out how we're going to get to scheme from all of these things we're doing. So pattern matching on types is something we're going to have to be able to deal with when we, when we run the programs. Uh, right, so I'll give you a bigger example. Again, this is something that you've probably seen before, but it's interesting to see how it plays out slightly differently when we have quantities in types. So, um, so vector or matrix transposition, this, this is... It's kind of the slightly beyond hello world of dependently typed programming. Because um, um, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you try to get, <laughs> sorry to mention this, we, we used to do this to our second year undergrads. We used to get them to do all sorts of interesting things with linked lists in Java. And one of the things we got them to do was, was transposing a linked list of linked lists. Because um, I think we didn't want them to come back for third year or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know but, um, now, um, if, you're doing, if, you have, if you have that information in the type, though, um, it's a lot easier to do it, um, and if you have quantities to think about, you actually learn a little bit more about what it is you're doing if you have, if you have quantities in, um, uh, for, for your variables. Okay, so let's, let's just try writing this in the, the usual way. So we'll add a candidate definition. Um, we'll see, it's always worth looking at the whole to see what we have, and seeing what we have, and seeing how many of them are available at runtime. So we have a matrix, and all of the other things are not available at runtime. So we'll case split on this matrix. Now for the, the empty matrix, the, the empty vector, or the empty matrix case, we have to produce a vector of M empty vectors. So um, some of you have seen this, seen what's coming. Some of you are ahead of me. Uh, what I usually do at this point is say, well, if I've got a hole that's a bit hard to fill in, I'll just lift it out to a top level definition and then we'll work with that. So we'll lift out empties and we'll try implementing empties. So what would we do? We need m of these, but we're only allowed to talk about m. We're not allowed to use m. So we've just learned something about this program that we hadn't noticed before, which is that m is important at runtime. We need to know how many of these things we're going to generate. So the way to um, deal with I'll delete all of that. The way to deal with this is to say is to, to write m down. That's, so if we, so this, is a, this is an implicit argument binding. The, the, the difference between writing an implicit argument in this way, so it's sort of explicit, I don't know if it's explicitly, implicitly, an explicit implicit argument. <laughs> that we've written down the implicit argument. If you write it down, it's in the program. That's, that's the default situation. Is If you don't write it down, it's not in the program. If you do write it down, it is in the program. So this m, and notice we haven't given a quantity here. So if I don't give a quantity on this binding, that means... By default, it's just usable as many times as we like. So if I, if I do that case split again, and uh, I'll just do the same process as before and lift it out, now I have M. So I have M available because um, I said I was going to use it, and now I can just generate. Oops, now I can just generate it. OK, so we can have empties. Uh, now what about the second case? So. Um, I've written this program so many times that I don't even really think about what I'm doing anymore. Um, so um, so uh, we, we transpose the rest. Of, it's, it's like you, you chop off the top bit of the matrix. You transpose the rest, and we try to rotate that first line onto the matrix. So uh, the interesting thing here is what happens when I lift out the, uh, the definition. So we lift out our transpose helper. And that's a completely legitimate definition for transpose helper. We've got all of these things. And we could even generate a definition for that. Um, so there's a definition for that. Anyone reckon that's going to work? <laughs> uh, I mean, we, th there's an alarm bell ringing already. So all we're trying to do here is put a vector on top of a transposed vector. It's probably not that complicated. Um, I've actually run this. It doesn't terminate. <laughs> the, 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 program, the program search mechanism is not yet connected to the totality checker. So it doesn't know that this is probably a bad thing. Um, anyway, there's something we know about this program that we haven't told the machine. Uh, what do we know about this program that we haven't told the machine? 
How many times do we need to look at a matrix to transpose it? How many times will the elements, will each element of the first of the input matrix appear in the output matrix if we've got this right? Once. once, exactly once. Why don't we tell it that? Let's tell it that. Now what happens? So if I look at, I'll, I'll look at this whole type before I lift it out. What have we got? We've got, um, we've got our transpose matrix. There's one of them. We've got the matrix that we had, but we've spent it. So there's no point in having it when we lift out transpose helper. So let's lift it out. Let's search. Done. So it's kind of fun that, um, yeah, this is completely accidental that, this, that I noticed this, is that, that now that we have this quantity, we've got a bit more information. And so there's a bit of this talk. I mean, I've given this talk a lot. You've probably seen me give this bit of the talk a lot of times, some of you. Um, there's this bit where I just sort of kind of brush under the carpet the fact that I've taken out X's because I know, I know I'm not going to use it. Well, now I can tell the machine, and it can do the job for me. So that's, that's kind of pleasing. Uh, oh, uh, just because there's actually something, there's, there's a little, I, I have to be a little uh, uh, different in the way I define vectors. So in, in vectors, I'm, this, the, the type of cons, there's no restriction on the, the, the element type. And I've said that the tail, there's going to be one. So if, if there is one vector, there is one of the tail but I might have an unrestricted number of the elements because the elements might come from somewhere else. So I could actually, so this is, this is another difficulty with QTT actually, is figuring out how many of each thing you want in data types. So the reason that's come out as many is basically because of the way I wrote down the type of vector. I could have written down the type of vector in other ways. I think it would have been okay to do this. So the, the type of Oh, but not its elements. Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So I was. Uh, so 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 it's like we got the right answer, but not quite for the right reason. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How many times are we going to each, use each of the rows exactly once? So next time I give, I'm not going to do this now because I'm a bit scared of seeing what it'll do. Next time I give this talk, I'm going to see if that works. And, uh, thank you. Okay. So I have. Uh, we haven't seen any scheme yet. We haven't seen any compilation yet. Um, I I I've written a main program for this that just generates some. Just to, just to actually see some scheme. Um, so we load, um, let's see, vector trans, that was the one, wasn't it? So, um, and we can uh, execute that. Um, so, that, but what, so what that was doing was uh, generating some scheme and then running it. So I can also generate uh, an executable. So this, um, so by default it's generating uh, Shea scheme, so what do we see? We see um, transpose.ss is the source code, transpose.so is, is the object code, and I am going to show you what it looks like. So this, um, I wrote this myself. Uh, I haven't written much scheme before, so it's probably a bit ugly. Um, I didn't write this myself. This is, this is what the machine generates. <laughs> so when I said you were going to be horrified, that's what, uh, so the main F1185, obviously, that's a, yeah. <laughs> Tell what that does, uh, and then we've got our, you know, our helpers. So you see, actually, some of the ways, some of the ways that uh, that that scheme is being used here, and and actually, that's one of the real things I wanted to get out of this talk, is there's probably some people in this room who actually know scheme, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd I'd like to know if there are better ways of of generating code for the data types that I'm currently doing. So essentially, what I do is is every data type. Uh, um, uh, a constructor has, is a tagged union. So you've got the tag that says what constructor it is, and you've got all the arguments. I'm doing that by saying this is a vector. Uh, the first thing in the vector is the tag, and then the, other, the rest of it are the, 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 the data structure. Now, maybe for some data types, I could say go to a list, an actual scheme list. But in general, like I, want so I want something that works the same way for all data types. So I'm just using vectors. And this is by experimentation. That's the fastest thing I've found there may be a better way. So if anyone knows a better way, I'd uh, love to know. Uh, you'll also Records don't work. What's that? Records don't work. Um, I'm going to pretend I knew that Scheme had records. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I will try that later. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, this is, so I, um, 
I would say I just inhaled R6 RS or uh, try to figure out what's going on. I learned something I've learned, by the way, I've got this on a later slide. Um, I, I was led to believe that, that all scheme implementations were all portable and the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's the reaction I thought I was going to get. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so it's generating, um, Shay scheme is a default. Uh, chicken scheme also works with some slight tweaks. Racket also works with some slight tweaks. There's trade-offs between them. Uh, Shea, I found, is consistently the fastest, uh, but has a bit of a startup cost, so chicken doesn't have the startup cost. Uh, Racket lets me have an executable. There's different library support for each of them. Um, so, so there's various trade-offs, but essentially, it's scheme. There is... Um, there is a source file that generates all the bits of scheme that are the same, and there are a few support files that generate all the bits of scheme that aren't the same. So, um, right. So that's that's what it looks like. That's what we're that's what we're up against. That's what we're generating. I'm going to show you one one more thing with QTT since I'm here, and I've got a little bit more time than I thought because I didn't do the introductory bit. Um, I'm going to show you the sort of thing that I really want to be able to do with quantities, uh, and that's that's. Um, I think I I think I've, all of the dependently typed programming I've ever done has been about dealing with ugly stuff at runtime. So, um, prog if 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 we're going to do anything interesting with the program, it has to interact with the outside world, and interacting with the outside world involves dealing with resources that could be in a particular state. So, um, like. There's a file, I open the file, I now know it's open. It's open for reading, so I can't write to it. So there's, there's, so, so that uh, we, know, we know what we have, and we know what we're allowed to do on these things, but we don't necessarily know when we're allowed to do it. Whereas QTT gives us this possibility of um, saying when we do things, as well as what things we do. So this is my favorite example of, introductory example of, of, of a state machine. It's, it's the door, I'm gonna show you the door. Um, so, uh, without going into much detail about this L1 thing, I'll, I'll just, uh, just, uh, just for the minute, trust that this is a thing. I'll show you the, I'll show you the details of the thing in a moment. But uh, an L1M of door closed is a program that runs in some context M. Uh, M might stand for monad, I suppose. Uh, it might also stand. Oh, that's, that's, that's the way I explain monads, by the way, uh, uh, to my undergraduates. So I show them the type of the, 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 the type signature of bind, and I tell them to pronounce M a method for getting a thing of type, and that seems to work for more students than I expected. So I'm pronouncing this M method for getting a thing of type. So it's the context where it doesn't have to be a monad. It just it's just more, most often it is a monad. Uh, right, so, so the fact that this says L1 means that the door that comes out is a door that I can only use once. Um, so that means if I, if I do use it, like if I knock on the door, I've used it. So I have to get a door back. It's the same door, but I've, I've spent the old door. So um, to open a door, so oh, notice I'm, I'm, just, I'm explicitly saying that this, door, this is going to use the door exactly once, so it's going to be spent. Um, so I'm not going to tell you what res is, except to say that it's, a, it's kind of a dependent pair type. So it's, it's, uh, I'll, I'll show you the details of res again in a moment. Um, so it returns some, some Boolean, and that Boolean says whether the door successfully opened or not. So if we're, doing, if we're working with a state machine, we don't necessarily get to say whether the state transition worked. Sometimes, sometimes we are in control, sometimes the environment is control. So we're trying to open the door, let, let's say this is implemented by a robotic arm and the robotic arm has jammed um, so it might not open okay so let's um, let's try writing that program so this this door prog so the l without the one just says the thing we're returning is unrestricted um, i've given it a very short name because i'm hoping to get this this type used a lot and if it's going to be used a lot, it should have a short name. I mean, there should be a, a campaign against giving things one-letter names in, uh, in functional programming. But I think if it's, truly, <laughs> if, it's, if it's truly generic, if it really doesn't matter what it is, or if you're using it all over the place, literally everywhere, I think it's okay. The rest of the time, maybe not. Okay. Um, so what do we do? We'll create a new door. Let's, let's see what happens if we, not new four. That won't work. Um, 
I said some keys are in the wrong place. That one isn't. Uh, right, so, uh, okay, so what have we got? Um, M, we can talk about it, but we haven't got it. Uh, D, we have exactly one door. So let's, let's knock on the door and let's return a D prime. So we need to get a door back when we, when we knock on it. Um, uh, so we can't use D anymore. We've spent it. We can talk about, you know, the, the glorious past when we used to have a D. <laughs> um, but we can't have it back. And if only people would learn that. Um, did I say that out loud? Sorry. <laughs> um, so it, it, let's just call it D, because it, it's, 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 it's easier if, if we keep the same name for the same thing. Um, by the way, this is another thing I'd like about QTT. I'd, I'd like some notion of borrowing. I'd like to be able to say that, that um, essentially, I'd like, I'd like something where I don't have to explicitly return the D. I'd like to say that I, I, I will give you the door, and as long as you promise that the door is going to be untouched, uh, so maybe there'll be, there'll be a, a definition of borrowing that, that allows a function to pass it around to other things that borrow and then just give it back untouched. I don't quite know how to do that. Um, maybe it's something we'll think about later. But for the minute, it's just a minor syntactic inconvenience that I have to, that I have to return it. So um, let's, let's try opening the door. So um, let's, uh, let's just call it OK, and I have to open the door D. So that will give us back, what is OK? OK is, is some res. I don't know anything about res. It's in a library. Uh, I haven't implemented the documentation search for this yet. So what we're going to do is blunder on and just use it. We're going to try looking at it and seeing what happens. This is what type-driven development is all about. <laughs> it's about blundering on with what you've got, seeing what the machine tells you, and let the machine help you by doing stuff for you instead of merely giving you documentation or merely giving you autocomplete. So let's, let's do uh, a case analysis of it. Um, <laughs> oops, that's the wrong button. Um, so if I check now, so I've spent OK by doing a case analysis on it, but I have, I have a thing that can help me. I can use that once. So uh, I guess the thing to do is case split on it. I wish it wouldn't move the cursor around when I did that, but um, that's, uh, that's what we wanted. So what have we got? We've got, um, so it turns out to be a, a val at a resource. So this at is just chosen because it's like we have a thing at a particular place. So the val is the result of uh, whether it succeeded or not, and the resource is the thing that we, the, the thing that was wrapped up inside this result. So the resource is a door. And if val is true, then the door is open, otherwise it's closed. So there's a, there's, a, there's a strong hint as to what we should do next here. We won't know anything about this door unless we inspect the value. So let's inspect the value. And whoops, that's because I didn't save it. Um, so now we, in, this, in this first case, we have an open door. So I guess we should just close it. Um, I wish I hadn't made this indentation sensitive sometimes. Uh, so, uh, what? What have I done wrong? No, oh, it's called resource. That's just the name that it had in the in the in the library. So, um, so we know a closed door, and if we we can't finish this, so we've got we've got one D here, um, and one means it's used exactly once. So we can't get out of this program. There's no way out of this unless we cleanly delete that door. So we've got a thing called delete door, which is exactly what it does. So <laughs> what, did, what did you expect? Come on. Um, so that's fine. It type checks. Brilliant. Ship it. Uh, and in this case, uh, in this case, we've got a closed door, so we can just delete it, and we're done. Uh, called resource. Right, we're finished. So that's uh, state tracking using QTT to explain um, that we can only use this thing once, and uh, to explain, uh, yeah, that we have to we have to get rid of it before uh, before the 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 the, the, uh, the program is finished. So, why might we want that in reality? Because opening and closing doors is yeah okay, it's a nice illustration of what state tracking is done, but it's not something you'd see in a pro. I mean, it's kind of analogous to files, perhaps. Um, 
a more, more fun thing you can do is describe concurrent, uh, concurrent protocols or, uh, or distributed system protocols with it. So just quickly, I'll, uh, I've, I've, I've hacked up um, a kind of limited form of session types. So we can describe protocols as being, um, uh, well, this is, a, this is a protocol where uh, a client sends a, re a Boolean request, and if, the, if, if that Boolean is true, the server will send back a character, otherwise it will send back a string. And then this, uh, this, we can use this to compute types of channels, and the type of a channel tells us what we have to do on that channel next. So, um, so for example, a client, that's, that's the, the channel is a client of the test protocol. That means we have to send a Boolean and given that we sent a false here, that means we need to get back uh, a string. So this, uh, so it, it actually makes more sense if I um, if I put holes in, doesn't it? Um, so, um, so you know, if you if you don't know what's going on in, in an Idris program, put a hole in and see. Let, let the machine tell you what is happening at a particular point. This this is a habit that uh, it's really good to be in. It's, it's essentially it's what I do. If I get an error message in my Idris program, I look at the line number. I don't read the error message. I look at the line number, put a hole on that line, see what I've got, what I expected. So what have we got? We've got a channel that the first thing we have to do on it is send. We don't need to look at the rest. That's the rest of the protocol. The first thing we have to do on this channel is send something. So, so we send something. And so, oh, we send a false. So the next thing we have to do on that channel is receive a string. If we send a true, the next thing we have to do on that channel is receive a character. So this, this idea of, of using quantity, uh, quantities for describing state machines we can go from something simple like the door to something really powerful like correct concurrent programming remarkably quickly. So um, I won't bother showing that running because it's, it's just more horrific scheme code. Um, <laughs> so let's um, finish. I just want to show a, a little bit of detail about, um, about what's going on inside. So that's the end of the demo. We've got about 15 minutes left. Is that right? So. Um, so say a little bit about the internal. So the current status of the system and, um, uh, and, and what's going to happen next. Oh, by the way, if anyone's interested in that whole L, L1 magical stuff, I think it's kind of neat the way it all fits together. I won't show you here, but if you want to hear more about it, I'm totally happy to, to show you. Um, so what have we got? We've got, uh, so you can see it on, on, uh, on GitHub. There, there's, um, so I, I, was, I was hiding away in my cupboard hacking on this for a bit, and I made it public a, a, a couple of months ago. Uh, maybe less than that. Uh, since then, people have started contributing, which is fantastic. So some people have started contributing libraries. What, what a lot of people are doing is, is taking libraries from Idris 1 and seeing if they work in Idris 2. And pleasingly, they mostly do. The sort of situation where they don't is where it turns out we're using an implicit argument at runtime that we didn't realize. And this is good to learn. <laughs> It's good to learn that, that our programs weren't quite behaving at runtime the way they thought they were, and QTT is telling us that. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to find that happening. Uh, so we've got the core language. We've got an intermediate language. So, the intermediate, so I've, uh, I've tried to keep the compilation pipeline quite clean so that we have... Um, so the, the, the Idris 2 just desugars. It's, it's purely desugaring to a, a, um, an intermediate language, which is QTT plus implicit arguments plus a couple of high-level constructs like uh, dependent case, dependent records. Uh, dependent record update. The dependent record update is magical. It's it's uh, it's, it's it's great to have that sort of thing. Um, uh, and the thing about doing this, uh, something I want to do, uh, if people would stop, l let me stop working on Idris for a moment. Something I'd love to do is is a, an imperative language with dependent types, with TT imp as the core and linear types to keep me to keep me straight on the. Um, on, on the kind of updates, on the, uh, the mutation. And, and this is something like the first day of ICFP, I probably shouldn't say, but it's not actually functional programming that I like. It's types. It's the, <laughs> and it's just that functional programming, it's so much easier to do fancy stuff with types if you're working in a functional programming language. But now I'm thinking, well, what of the imperative programming can we get back? And um, don't look at me like that. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'd like to have a crack at that, but I'm going to work on I'm going to work on Idris too for a while first. Don't worry. Uh, so, what's the pipeline? We've got uh, uh, so I've said as I said, TTIMP is um, QTT plus a, a bit of implicitness that elaborates to QTT or a variation of it, which is 
Uh, fully explicit, and I say independently checkable. So that means that, at least in theory, you could, you could take this data structure, you could feed it to somebody else's type checker, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it, this is the kernel of the system. It's a few hundred lines of Idris code. Uh, the type checks it, checks that all the quantities uh, match up uh, OK. Uh, all it gives us is uh, top-level data declarations and pattern matching, so the terms don't even have cases in them. It's it all just function application, um, variables, bindings, uh, and pattern matching. So there's not really an awful lot there. Um, so that's the thing that we're trying to compile down to scheme or whatever. Uh, so there's another level. Uh, yesterday I had to come up with a name for this, and I was a bit tired, so I hadn't come up with a good name yet. Um, like in in the in the in the source code, it's just called compileexp. And no, don't, anyway, so it's uh, let's call it QTTIR. So this is um, this is a slightly uh, sli slightly enriched QTT in that um, it. it um, it has uh, case expressions available, but they're only simple case expressions. So, so we, if we pattern match on something, we know what constructor it is, but we don't, we don't get to go inside the patterns. We only get the variables out. So that's, that turns out to be a really easy thing to compile because all we have to do is what tag is it, assign the variables, move on. So yeah, it's QTT with, uh, with those case trees, simple case trees added, and all the zero multiplicities this is, this is now safe because the type checker has told us that it's safe. Everything that is a zero multiplicity is just erased. So, um, so now to, if you want to know what is there at runtime and what isn't, you look at the type. If it says zero, it's not there at runtime. And you know it's not there at runtime because they get erased here. And that translates pretty much directly to scheme. So, um, so faced with the prospect of explaining how Idris translates to scheme, I realized that I was not going to be able to fill an hour because literally it's directly, it's everything just has an obvious mapping into scheme. Not necessarily an efficient mapping, but at least an obvious mapping into scheme. So this is kind of what we've got. We've got variables, primitive values, functions. I mean, you, you, the, the only thing here that might not have the most direct translation into scheme is these simple case trees. Um, but even then, scheme has case, so um, uh, look, at the, look at the tag, uh, deconstruct the arguments, move on. Uh, so it's nice that, that so Idris has uh, laziness in the, at the type level. So you explicitly say in the type that something is lazy, and you know, thank you scheme, delay enforcer there. I can, uh, I, they just translate directly into schemes delay enforce. Possibly the only interesting thing about this in the end is how we deal with foreign functions. Um, so uh, the way operators are, uh, deal with operators in general is um, uh, you're allowed to define, uh, you're, allowed to, you're allowed to state that some function is implemented externally. So I call these external primitives. Um, so we have, naturally we have external primitives for things like integer addition and you know, the, the usual arithmetic comparison operators. Um, but we can go a bit further. We can actually do this for foreign function calls too. And foreign function calls, because we have because we have an explicit type system, we can describe the type of a foreign function just using an Idris type. So this this type at the top here, this this frg list, this is um, uh, oh there should be there should be curly brackets around a colon type. Um, I, <laughs> I I added this this morning, so I haven't syntactically highlighted it yet. Or. But uh, so this should be brackets around the A column type. Um, but this is this is just a list, um, a, a heterogeneous list. So it's, uh, where each element of the list is essentially a pair of the type and a value of that type. So when we come to compile the foreign function call, we see that oh this thing is an int and that's its value. And as long as the back end knows how to marshal that, you know, turn that Idris value into a, a, the appropriate scheme value, which Spoiler, it's just the identity function most of the time. Um, then, then we can make the foreign call. So the way that shows up in the library is, uh, so sleep from the system library, so Blodwin sleep. So this is the, I, I, I called, a, I had a, a, a system I was developing that was kind of Idris one and a half that I called Blodwin. And I decided to leave the evidence of that name because people like the name. Um, so 
Uh, so this is just calling a bit, a, a bit of support code. So scheme call will translate it directly into scheme. C call will translate it into C. So this is where the variations between the different scheme um, implementations is really annoying because everything, everyone does it in a, in a different way. And it's not just a slightly different way, it's a creatively different way. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, so, I could, so only, only, Shea, only the Shea backend can handle this at the minute. Uh, but, so this is, this is an end cursors binding that I was, I was working on. But again, all I do is I say, I'll make a, I'll make a C call uh, to this function with this argument and we'll let the backend deal with it. So it's kind of, um, it's partly because we have uh, the expressive type system that it's, that it's easy enough to do this just as operators. Uh, and partly just because it's the cheapest thing to do. Um, just a little bit of the internals. It's interesting to see how I.O. works. We, we've got an I.O. monad just like Haskell does. And it works in pretty much the same way. So um, I mean, I.O., I think of I.O. as being, uh, st it's, it's still pure. It's a description of what's going to happen when you execute the program. And one way that that could work is, is to say that, well, we have every program takes the state of the world as an input and it returns an updated state of the world and the return value as the output. And within GHC, there's sort of promises made the developer, by the developers that they're not gonna mess this up and they're not gonna you know, duplicate the world. Uh, here, so world is the primitive for representing the world. It's really just a token, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nil value. It's just a token to say that this is, this is this, I, I currently have uh, the state of the world. I'm the one who's allowed, allowed to work with it. And you explicitly say that there's only one of it. Um, so that means that the type checker is making sure that when I implement this library for doing I.O., uh, I don't screw up. Uh, and then so when I actually do a scheme call, I'm, I'm working with this primitive I.O. result. So all the back end has to know, the back end doesn't have to know anything about the I.O. monad, how I.O. works. All the back end has to know about is this type, is that the world is a pair of um, a result and um, an updated state of the world. And it doesn't even have to know that very often. It only has to know that when it's making foreign calls to turn the foreign calls into something that works uh, inside Idris. Uh, okay, is that a question? Yeah, this word types looks like it is basically erased then. Yeah. But it's not a zero. Uh, yeah, the com well, it, it's, it's, it's erased because its implementation in the compiler is exactly the same as everything else that's erased. Um, so, so the representation of the world is literally nil. So, um, so yeah, uh, I mean, the compiler, the, the compiler can, uh, uh, an Idris backend can do whatever it likes with this world type. So it can implement it however it likes. So as far as the type checker is concerned, there is one world that only one thing is allowed to modify at a time. Um, cheats a bit when we come to concurrency, actually. It, it invents a new world. Uh, it means that gloriously I have two functions called, one's called unsafe create world and one's called unsafe destroy world. <laughs> um, and it's a, so a program is, a, unsafe perform IO is, is a function that unsafe create world, do the thing, unsafe destroy world, and then we're done. So um, yeah, so that's how IO works. Right, so um, that's basically the end. Uh, just a few lessons. Scheme is a really convenient target language. I, I was really pleased with how well this worked out. I was expecting it to be just like a, a stopgap, but then it was faster than the Idris 1 runtime, so I thought, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend weeks implementing a thing that's going to be slower than the thing I've already got. That would be ridiculous, so I'm not going to do that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really convenient. It's almost, not quite a direct translation, but near enough a direct translation from, uh, from the IR that we have. Um, so uh, also, well, lesson, Shea scheme is incredibly fast. I guess if you have three decades of Cisco engineers, that's, that's going to be... Not, not Cisco. It's not Cisco, okay. I, uh, it, was, it was largely done at Indiana University. But oh, of course, course. Of, course, of course it was done at Indiana University. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All the cool stuff is done at Indiana. Anyway, three decades of, of talented engineers, wherever they happen to be located, is going to beat my fortnight of sea hacking. That's just the lesson here. Um, so... Amusingly, it's competitive with GHC in my experiments so far. So, um, uh, so GHC with, I put strictness annotations everywhere just to give it a fighting chance. And, and, and it's, still, it's still won in my little experiment. As soon as you go higher order, it's not so good. So higher, uh, the, the, I haven't figured out how to get Shea Scheme to do higher order functions uh, as efficiently as I would like. It might just be that it's not set up to do that, in which case, never mind. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of cool to see that it's competitive with 
I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call Haskell a competitor, uh, but it's something, it's something that, I, uh, that I would like to be close to Haskell performance, at least, just to show that this is a usable system. So it's nice to see that's happening. Um, yeah, it's even better when turning off the runtime checks. Uh, we've already done the checks. I don't, need to, I don't need Scheme to be checking that I'm, I'm not pulling out a thing from a vector that I don't have access to, because I've already done that. I know it's going to be fine. And if it's not, it's my fault. So um, this, this seems to give like 20% performance benefit, something like that. Um, I mean, this isn't, this, these are just numbers I've pulled out, uh, just, uh, but it's, it's roughly what I'm seeing. Um, so yeah, chicken and racket work too, uh, various trade-offs. I, I'm sort of wondering how the whole racket on Shea process is going to affect what, what I'm doing. Probably not at all, but, uh, not, or not very much. But with, with various trade-offs, you get good performance too. Um, so the scheme is not as portable as I believed. Um, in some slightly annoying way, so the, the EQ query uh, primitive, is that right? Um, it, it, I was finding it behaving differently in, in some surprising ways, but in ways which are consistent. You're nodding as if I'm not oh, good. I'm glad I'm not talking rubbish here. Um, ways which are completely consistent with uh, R6RS, but not with each other. Yeah. <laughs> Just some nodding like, yeah, I wish I did, that didn't happen either. Anyway, I learned that the hard way. There are multiple functional programming languages created in Scotland. Yes. The scheme is sort of like that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a good way of putting it. That's probably a good way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's a, a, a translation. At least we got their syntax the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay. So uh, I, have a, I have a couple of questions that I don't expect you to answer now. It's just some things I've been thinking about. Um, so are there better ways to generate codes? I'll look at records, certainly. Um, uh, higher order functions. Uh, I, maybe the problem is that uh, I, I, every function has exactly one argument, and maybe if I did a bit more work to, to kind of wrap up multiple arguments, it would probably work better. So, so that might, might be worth a try. Uh, this is this is merely an annoyance. People keep asking me, "Can I have a standalone executable with Shea?" And, and it turns out there's some complicated way I can do that. And I, this doesn't really bother me, but it, it seems to bother people that they don't want they don't want to have to have a uh, uh, a Shea environment on a system to be able to distribute it. So, but uh, that's kind of a small thing. But longer term, it's, it, which you think about is is Scheme actually the right default? Um, I think it's a pretty good default. It's a really convenient default. It's really quick to generate the code, and it starts up really quickly. So it seems like a perfectly good default to me. But maybe maybe we should we should look a bit further in the future. Look at OCaml, for example. I think OCaml would be a good target for really good performance. But something I the, the biggest bottleneck now in Idris 2, the, the, if, if you look at the profile, all of the time is spent evaluating at compile time, um, which is a big improvement on Idris 1 because all the time was spent doing all sorts of daft stuff like loading binary data that it didn't need to use, that sort of thing. Um, so it's, all, it's, it's doing evaluation a lot at compile time. So I wonder if we can do some kind of trick so Cog does this trick with the OCaml runtime to be able to use the OCaml runtime um, for compile time evaluation. And I wonder if this way generating scheme gives us some way into doing that cheaply. So that's, that's something I'd like to think about too. Okay, so I'm pretty much done. I have one more thing to say. I have an advert. Uh, I'm going to be hiring a postdoc soon. And if anyone's interested in this sort of stuff, essentially type-driven development, type-driven editing, interactive editing, three-year project, please come and talk to me. Uh, uh, I'll be around all week. Um, I haven't put the advert out yet. I literally heard two days ago officially that, that, this is, <laughs> that I'm going to get this money. So yay. So, uh, so I haven't been able to put the advert out, but this seems as good a time as any to find potential people to hire. So um, anyway, thank you very much for listening. Thanks for coming. I have two quick questions. So you've got a very nice book on Idris 1. Oh, thank you. Uh, do you have to forget anything about Idris 1 to learn Idris 2? Um, not really. Uh, the, the book mostly works. Uh, and to, so before I made it public, I went through, I've, I've got as far as chapter 12, so I've got three chapters still to go. Uh, and, and I tried every program and edited them. And there is a file in the repository that says what you have to do. So it's, 
actually it's not very, it's mostly about importing things. So the Idris One Prelude is massive. It has all sorts of stuff in, I, it's got the Fibonacci function in the Prelude. I have no idea why <laughs> the Fibonacci function was in the Prelude. So, so I've made the Prelude a lot smaller, which means you have to import some things explicitly, but that's basically it. Um, maybe Manning will come to me and say, do you want to do a second edition? And I will say no, <laughs> uh, and then someone will twist my arm. Maybe that's what will happen. But it, basically it works. It's, um, and if you want to learn about Idris 2, or is there a paper or tutorial or something like that at this point? Or uh, this enough people have asked me that, that the answer really ought to be yes, but it's not yet. Mm -hmm. So I will do that soon. Any more questions? Uh, not a question, but we have a new cross-language benchmark suite for Lean, two, uh, for Lean. So oh, right. Oh, I saw that. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. And you're getting some really good results. So yeah. that's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I actually, I actually saw that on the way here, and I thought, ooh, I must, I must try that. Yes. All right. I think um, oh, one more question in the back, actually. I think we have time. Um, yeah, sure. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned borrowing. Um, yes. Have you looked at Rust? Uh, <laughs> yes, I have, yes. <laughs> um, I don't think the same system would work, but we want something like it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I did implement something that, that worked, but I couldn't convince myself that it was sound. <laughs> so, and so it's not, I'm, I'm not doing anything if I'm not convinced that it's sound. Um, so I mean, there's, there's kind of a, there's some dubious translation from borrowing to returning pairs of a result and, and the, the thing. And, um, and I sort of had it on paper uh, that, that it was okay, but, um, Anyway, that's one for the future. But Rust has, we, we've got a lot to learn from Rust, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks so much. Okay, thank you.